Sorry about that, everybody. We had a little technical difficulty. Kelly, you're exactly right. Tech support puppy was no help at all. But I think I got things working now. Hopefully you all are still hanging in there. Oh. Welcome to another fine evening of good nature. Um, got all kinds of stuff and we're, we're getting a late start. I do apologize for that, but um, I've got some kind of corrupted file that I may or may not have to do with an upgrade they did today. We're gonna keep our fingers crossed that everything works out uh, for the best. Um, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna get going. Um, let me see if we can get our screen share going here. Um, we're gonna start off, um, as we always do, we're gonna start off with a recap. Uh, last week's column. And we're just going to skip. Through the altar beginning here, and we're going to go right into finally. Other people in the room. We're going to go right into our topic of this week, our main topic, which is the wasps. Um, so, you know, if you talk about an, uh, an insect that has an image problem uh, amongst, a PR problem amongst human beings, it's wasps. Um, you know, bees have this uh, reputation for being cute and fuzzy, and um, they're also vegetarians, which means, you know, they, they eat pollen, and they eat nectar, they provision their uh, nest, whether it's a, it's a colony like we see with our uh, bumblebees and our honeybees, or whether it's a solitary existence like uh, predominance of our native bees. Um, they feed themselves and their larvae hun uh, nectar and pollen. Now wasps, um, they're a little bit different in have a uh, carnivorous side to them. Maybe I should say insectivorous, um, although some do uh, feed on carrion from time to time. But uh, wasps uh, hunt and are actually very effective insect uh, control um, means. Uh, if we would just let the wasps do what they do best, we probably could save a lot of money on pesticides. Um, so many different wasps will specialize in uh, a specific type of insect or maybe a group of insects. Um, the, the wasp that I kind of focused in on last week was the great black wasp. And I, I tell you, it wasn't the carnivorous side of it that attracted me to it. At first, it was the way it was going nuts on my mountain mint. Uh, now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, plants that are great uh, attractants. Uh, if you want to get a lot of pollinator action in your yard, uh, a way to do that is to plant uh, bee balm. Uh, actually, planting native plants in general is, is going to draw uh, native insects into your yard. Um, but boy, there are some plants that really have a strong appeal to, to certain groups of, uh, of insects. And here um, we have uh, the flowers of mountain mint. And um, every day I would see these big black wasps drawn to them, um, taking advantage of the, uh, the nectar that these plants offer. At this stage of the game, the wasp itself, the adult wasp, is um, going to be feeding on nectar itself. It's not, it's past its carnivorous stage. It's in the larval stage that they require that animal protein. Um, what these great blast wasps do is they will uh, sting uh, grasshoppers and um, katydids too, actually, and um, drag them back, haul them back to their uh, burrows, which they dig in the ground, and they will feed those uh, insects that are stung 
but they're not dead. The, the, the venom in these wasps will paralyze the insect and make it so it can't move. But it, it, it's, it's the, uh, the wasp form of insect um, uh, of preservation. You know, if it were to sting and kill its prey to feed to its larvae, well, that wouldn't be good for the long-term survival of those wasp larvae down in the burrow because that stung us, uh, insect that was stung is going to start to decompose. And as the wasp larva develops, it's going to be feeding on, you know, the, the insect equivalent of rotten meat. And uh, that's not good for the long-term survival of uh, those little baby wasps. So a stinging, a paralyzing sting characterizes most of the solitary wasps that we have in our area. They will sting <laughs> and immobilize their prey, but it doesn't die. And uh, it then serves as the food for the next generation. So uh, great black wasp is the one that, that I uh, focused in on on the column, but it turns out there's lots of others in our area too. Um, and they kind of vary uh, more by the, uh, the types of soil that are available and what they can dig in, um, because these do all burrow into the soil. Some prefer a, a, a drier soil, um, a, a sandier soil, and some are in a, a moist, a more moist environment. Um, the katydid wasp, um, it looks very similar to um, the great black wasp, but for these orange legs. There's another uh, uh, Sphex wasp that's called the, uh, the blue cricket wasp, and it has a kind of a steely, iridescent blue nature to its wings and its back. But uh, again, uh, the, the females of these wasps are over an inch and a half long. Uh, the males tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, big difference too between male and female wasps, the, uh, remembering that stingers are modified ovipositors, it's, it's the females that sting and the males don't. The males are, are completely harmless. That is true of bees as well as uh, of wasps. Um, the great golden digger wasp, um, these two will uh, sting and immobilize a lot of our orthopterans. Um, they're a little bit more general. They don't um, zero in on the grasshoppers and the katydids the way the great black wasp does, but um, they'll go after um, uh, a lot of our, our hopping insects as well. And, uh, you know, always heard about those plagues of locusts. It's animals like the solitary wasps that are the natural control mechanism for those insects that can sometimes spiral out of control with their numbers. Now, um, th there's um, a variety of, a uh, great variety of wasps that are, are uh, prevalent at this time of year. Some are a lot more common than others. Uh, this one this one came to us courtesy of Sue Wagner. Sue, I know you said you, you took this picture a few years ago, and I wanted to include it because it shows just how tremendously diverse the hymenopterans are. Now this looks for all the world like an ant, doesn't it? Uh, but this happens to be the, uh, looks like I got a little typo there. Uh, the velvet ant is not an ant at all, uh, but it's the female version of a wasp that is also known as uh, the cow killer. Um, these um, little creatures, the females do have a very powerful sting. Um, yeah, I haven't experienced it yet. You know, there's a fellow out uh, there in internet land who's actually uh, graded uh, different stings, different uh, venoms, and uh, he's rated them on a, a scale of of pain. And I believe this one ranks up, it's not quite as high as, uh, uh, say, the fire ants and the bullet ants, uh, which, which are true ants, but it is quite a painful sting. Um, a lot of velvet ants will also specialize in their prey, and some actually specialize in a, another wasp that we have around here, uh, the uh, cicada killer. Now, um, I can't remember if we talked about those a few weeks ago, but cicada killers are uh, a very large uh, wasp that's uh, 
becoming, I think, more and more common in our area. It's uh, also close to two inches. It has the more characteristic um, uh, wasp coloring. Its, its abdomen is, is yellow and gold. Um, and it, not surprisingly, specializes in stinging and immobilizing cicadas. Um, well, the velvet ant can sting and immobilize the cicada killer. Uh, they prey on other wasps. So you, you can see in, in nature, there's just all sorts of checks and balances that occur. There's, um, if you can't really ever take away one thing and isolate it because it's connected to uh, all the other parts of the environment, which is, again, that's a, a whole fascinating part of ecology that we, we, we talk about every week. But everything is connected in one way or another. Now, um, there is one other uh, viewer supplied picture I wanted to show as we're talking about our wasps. Um, this one goes by the name of hornet, but it's uh, that's actually um, a bit of a misnomer. Bald-faced hornets are a type of wasp. Um, bald comes from uh, the, I believe it's an old English word that means white, and these hornets do have a white face to them, but these are the architects of these tremendous paper nests that you'll see, um, or sometimes you'll see them in trees. In this case, I believe it's on the underside of the deck. This was supplied to us by uh, Sarah Kimber. Uh, Sarah said that this has uh, been growing uh, above the swing uh, at her house. And um, I love this, this picture, Sarah, because here we've got our wasp and, and these two, now they're not a solitary wasp. These other wasps that we were looking at are for the most part solitary creatures um, that <laughs> dig burrows and um, provision them with insects. But these um, wasps are a, a eusocial wasp, which means that they have a, a sort of a social structure to, to how they conduct their lives. Um, they've got a queen. Her job is to uh, produce uh, offspring that will then become the workers that will then grow her colony, uh, the size larger and larger. All these little um, lines that we have here, that's all wood that these wasps have harvested. Uh, they chew it up, they mix it with their saliva, basically they make it into paper. And uh, I love looking at the variety of color and the paper of these nests because depending on the source of the wood, it can be quite white, it can be quite dark. Um, and as the, as the number of wasps inside grows, uh, the nest itself grows. Sometimes there'll be several tiers inside here. If you, if you were to tear one of these open, and I, I wouldn't recommend it, at least not while it's, it's being used, but uh, it's almost like a condo in there of levels of, and you'll see um, uh, combs, uh, paper combs like you see uh, with the paper wasp that nests underneath you, the eaves of your house. But there'll be tier after tier uh, of those combs that either have um, eggs in them or developing larvae, or they might be uh, sealed over, in which case that uh, larva is pupating and about to become an adult uh, wasp. Uh, they always will host um, guards at the entrance to their nests. And here, Sarah, you captured this perfectly. Here's the guard right here. And, um, they don't need a whole lot of provocation. Now, I remember, Sarah, you said that you're able to still use the swing. Uh, they're, they're willing to share their space with you, but uh, that whole saying about man is a hornet's nest that can uh, come to be if, um, they, uh, if you approach and, and act uh, in a threatening manner towards the nest. This, these guards are capable of sounding an alarm that will have the rest of the colony out uh, coming after you. Uh, now, there's always a question, I get, now this, this one is, is pretty obvious there on the uh, underside of the deck, but um, a lot of times these nests are built in trees and you really don't see them until the leaves start to fall. And I tell you, every fall, I'll get uh, calls or emails about, oh my gosh, this hornet's nest in the tree, what am I gonna do? 
Um, these are only used for a single season, you know, well, a, a single year, you know, spring, summer, fall. Once the hard frost comes, um, these guys are going to die. They will have already raised next year's queens, which will disperse. Uh, those queens will overwinter in leaf litter or under logs. Uh, they'll come out next spring and then they'll start their own uh, nests um, with just a few cells, a few offspring. And as that colony grows, then uh, the queen can devote herself not to nest making, but to uh, raising more hornets. But I always try to advocate for people to leave the nest once they've discovered them, uh, especially if we're into November and December. The nest isn't going to be causing any harm at all in those uh, little nuggets inside, whether it's the adult hornets or it's uh, larvae that are in various stages of development. That's the protein that a lot of our winter uh, birds and mammals need uh, to survive. They can tear open that paper and um, they have all kinds of delicious uh, frozen treats in there. Uh, and, and you'll see this. Um, it might be a, a squirrel that first tears it open. It might be a chickadee or a woodpecker. But there's, there's many different animals that will seek these nests out and uh, will use those to supply the energy that they, they need to get through the winter. So um, if you've got any questions on, on wasps, we can take those at the end. Uh, but we're going to switch gears now. Um, and this was a request we had last week to talk a little bit about fox snakes. Now, um, Linda Volan, I think you're with us tonight. Uh, these were uh, your pictures. Linda um, had called and emailed, um, gosh, I think this was now a couple of years ago, after having found not one but two fox snakes in her garage. Um, and as you know, that personally, that's my dream. Um, I don't think, Linda, that was your dream. That's the sense I got anyway. Uh, you can see here the snakes were relocated not far, just to the back of the property. But what it sounded like was that there was a, a long, um, large, heavy-bodied fox snake, and then there was a somewhat smaller one, uh, which uh, to me sounded as though we had a male and a female. With snakes, um, is with so many different animals we have around here. The, the females are larger, and the males tend to be a little bit smaller and uh, thinner body. Um, the thing with fox snakes is that they don't look like uh, what's probably our area's most common snake, which is the garter snake. Uh, garters are dark bodied. Some people say they're dark green. Some other people see them more as a, a dark, um, like a black color. But they're, they're mostly characterized by a bright uh, yellow stripe down their back. When you veer away from that general type of pattern and you start getting into this area of blotches, people's minds tend to go towards, well, rattlesnakes because rattlesnakes are um, blotchy like this. Um, let's take a look at the fox snake close up. Now this, I have to say, a little emotional here. This is Fo uh, Frankie the fox snake. Frankie is no longer with us. He lived here at the Park District uh, from 2008 until 2019. Uh, so we had him for 11 years. Prior to that, uh, Frankie, his past was a little uncertain. Uh, we got him from the Bartlett Nature Center, who found him, in, he was all dirty, and he was in a dirty box, and he was terribly uh, underweight. His, his belly actually caved in. Um, we think what happened was that someone had caught Frankie in the wild and tried to keep him as a pet. Uh, catching an adult snake and trying to, uh, in the wild, and you know, trying to tame it down and make it into a pet doesn't always go real well. Um, and we don't even know, you know for sure if that was the case. If it was, maybe they didn't feed it, offer him the right types of foods. Fox snakes are... Um, one of our area's main controllers of rodents. Uh, little fox snakes eat little rodents and big fox snakes eat bigger rodents. Uh, so um, a, a hatchling fox snake um, might raid a, a mouse nest. 
in a, a snake the size of Frankie. Frankie was about four feet long. It's capable of eating a good sized mouse or a, a chipmunk even. Um, well, anyway, Frankie uh, came to us as an adult, a uh, black snake, and we um, had a, a little hard time ourselves getting him to eat. I found he, he wouldn't eat at all if we just uh, offered him a, we, we feed all of our snakes here, uh, frozen rodents that we buy in bulk, we thaw them out. Uh, he didn't want anything to do with a, a thawed out mouse in his cage. So we had to get kind of creative. I tried wiggling it, that didn't entice him much. What actually worked for, for Frankie was to take the thawed out mouse, drag it around inside a cabinet, uh, the, the room, this was even before we had Hickory Knolls, this was over at Potawatomi. I would drag the mouse around the inside of a, a wall cabinet and then I'd put him in there so that it was dark. I would lock the cabinet up so that it was um, more or less escape proof. There was a, a couple of times where that didn't work and I got in a little bit of trouble for having a snake loose in the community center. But anyway, we always found him and um, he would, uh, it kind of recreated a hunting experience for him and over time he started to feed and we got him back up to what would be a normal weight for a male black snake um, and then unfortunately he kind of you know went to that uh, you know great black snake land in the sky last year um, and we, we estimated he was in his 20s we'd actually stopped using him for programming because we could uh, feel his bones uh, his vertebrae and his back kind of creaking as we held him. Um, we didn't want to use him for programming at, after that point because of his uh, you know, advanced age and, and fragile nature. But this, uh, you can't get a, a more quintessential looking fox snake than Frankie was. Uh, to identify these snakes, you want to look uh, for a couple of different things. Uh, some are noted in field guides and others are just sort of camisms, I guess you'd call them. Uh, one thing a field guide will refer to are the keels. Uh, fox snakes are a member of the rat snake uh, family and they have what are called weakly keeled scales. So if you look on these dorsal scales here along Frankie's back, uh, if you look real close, you'll see there's a kind of a raised ridge in the middle of the scale. You can see them here, here, up here. Um, fox snakes are called weakly keeled snakes. Um, there's other snakes like uh, our garters and our water snakes, um, bull snakes. They have a much stronger keel, but you, you can see here, this is a good example here. This raised ridge is the keel on the snake. It causes the fox snake to have a more of a matte finish as opposed to a real shiny uh, sort of a look to the scales. Um, another thing to look for is this little um, mask here. Now, this isn't a fox snake exclusive, but it, it to me is an easy uh, identifier uh, when you, when you see this, this band across the nose here, uh, some other snakes may have it, um, but it's not as prominent and it's not as consistent uh, between the eyes the way it is with the fox snake. Uh, there's usually uh, a long line here coming off the back of the eye, um, and then uh, kind of a, a flattened look to the front of the nose, long, long, long uh, flattened look on the front of the face, okay? Again, that's something you'll see in the uh, field guides, but something you kind of come to recognize over time. I think it has to do with the shape of the scales on the fox snake. Now, around here, like, the, the, you won't confuse these with garter snakes. However, we do have a couple uh, of snakes that you might find some similarities with. Uh, one is the eastern milk snake. Now this is the milk snake we have at Hickory Knolls. You might be looking at her and thinking, oh my goodness, she doesn't look at all like Frank. Well, um, if we put them side by side, here uh, you can see now Frankie's pattern is um, it blotches down the back. I've 
and then um, another row of blotches on either side. The milk snake, by comparison, it also has blotches, uh, but the space in between forms more of a band going across the snake. Uh, Mary happens to be quite red, but a lot of the milk snakes we have in our area um, are more of a, especially as they get older, this, this red turns kind of a brick red, which can tend to be more brownish. Um, you'll notice though that there is a dark um, border to those um, reddish brown patches down the back. So that's a big identifier. Um, milk snakes tend to have a sort of a Y-shaped light-colored marking at the back of what would be kind of, I guess, the snake's neck. Um, and then they don't have that, that connecting dark uh, mark on the front of the nose. You see how her nose is kind of more snub looking too, whereas Frankie's is longer? That's uh, characteristic of milk snakes versus fox snakes. And then, <laughs> excuse me, we uh, mentioned those keels. So on the fox snake, this is a, a diagram showing what a keel looks like on a snake. Fox snakes are weakly keeled. Um, milk snakes, which actually belong to the same genus as king snakes, are smooth scaled snakes. So. Um, their scales look very shiny. In fact, the genus they belong to is Lampropeltis. Lamp, meaning shiny, and pelt, uh, meaning skin. So shiny skin snakes. Uh, the, uh, we don't have a lot of smooth uh, scaled uh, snakes in this area, uh, other than the, uh, the milk snake and the, the smooth green snake, which is, is very, very rare, but, and it's green. So you're not gonna mix that up with these snakes at all. But um, so if it's, if it's shiny, smooth, almost looks wet, uh, even if the, the colors here are, are browner than what you see here on Mary, uh, that's going to be a milk snake. Uh, milk snakes are also smaller and they're much, uh, tend to be more secretive than the fox snakes. Fox snakes you'll occasionally find um, uh, basking on pathways. I know I've seen them over at Nelson Lake Marsh, uh, Dick Young Forest Preserve. Um, we get calls from people in Batavia a lot of times who have found fox snakes um, in their basements, uh, in their kids' sandbox. Uh, there's, there's pockets of fox snakes. Uh, there was a fox snake actually over at the uh, Mill Creek, um, the, the uh, pool in the Mill Creek subdivision that caused quite a stir when they were setting the, the pool chairs out one spring day. So. Um, they, they do uh, both, uh, the fox snakes do have a, a somewhat unsettling habit in that they will um, shake their tail when they're uh, agitated. A lot, of, a lot of snakes will do this, but when you combine that behavior with a snake that's, that's kind of brownish and blotchy, people, again, always think that it's a rattlesnake. Now, the, the one snake that, uh, the venomous snake that could possibly occur in this area has not been sighted since the 1870s in King County. That's the, the uh, Massasauga, uh, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. It's actually got uh, quite a few um, differences. Uh, it's got a, a larger head and a thinner neck. So it's got that, that triangular shaped head that's associated with venomous species. Um, it has a very strongly keeled um, set of scales. And of course it has a rattle on the end of its tail. So when it shakes, it does give more of a hissing sound. Now a, a fox snake can shake its tail in dry grass and make a bit of a sound, um, but it is, uh, it's a pretty good um, you know, imitation of a rattlesnake, but uh, they are, are not venomous at all. All snakes do have teeth and all snakes can bite, but uh, they are not um, going to be harmful other than uh, maybe a little bit of blood. We'll actually get to that in another slide. Um, you probably don't go to this length of um, identification, but it, you might want to keep in your back pocket. Even if you happen to find a dead snake, 
um, you can do this if you, if you don't you know, want to handle a, a live snake and risk getting bit. Uh, snakes have uh, an area, uh, the, the cloaca is where they eliminate waste and um, in snakes that lay eggs, like our milk snake and our fox snake, uh, the eggs would uh, come from this area too. This is um, the, I think of it as the all-purpose shoot because everything comes out of a snake down here. It's right at the base of the tail. Some people call it the vent, the cloaca. Um, it's covered by a scale that in some uh, snakes, uh, primarily those with keeled scales, uh, and we're talking the non-venomous species here, um, uh, keeled scales and a divided anal plate. So this, this um, covering over the cloaca will have uh, a slit in it. Uh, Mary has smooth scales and a single anal plate. So, um, and if, if you're so inclined and you're wondering you know, which of these similar species you might have, then you're able to catch the snake, turn it over and look, um, uh, look at this, uh, this divided or single anal plate. So single and smooth means uh, milk snake and uh, divided and keeled would indicate um, the fox snake. Now there's, there's one other snake I'm gonna toss in there just because um, there is some confusion in some areas, and that's the uh, northern water snake. So you'll see it too has a blatchy, blotchy pattern. Uh, we've covered this, I think, uh, in weeks past too, but the, the blotchy pattern on the northern water snake um, it's blotchy down the, the kind of the back three quarters of the body, maybe you know, two thirds of the body, but up at the front, it's got uh, dark bands that traverse the body from one side to the other. So um, the blotchy pattern doesn't start until farther down on the body. Uh, you can see in this picture too, it's strongly killed. Uh, so these snakes tend to look very uh, rough uh, and they feel very rough too. Um, in fact, they're also very prone to biting. This was a snake that we found on a, one of our King County Certified Naturalist field trips last year. And um, I sort of didn't want to get bit, but I sort of did, just so people can see um, that these snakes, they, they are the only snake I know of in this area that will bite first and ask, ask questions later. These guys, um, you know, other snakes will try to get away, and if they have uh, no other reason, you know, if you're really holding on to them, they're going to bite you. But uh, sometimes water snakes will just, you know, bite you if you're just close by. They'll actually come toward you and uh, go on the offensive, which is which kind of uh, unusual for snake behavior. But uh, you can see how dull the snake looks. Um, this was in the springtime, and springtime snakes have just come out of... Uh, their uh, rumation period, the snake uh, form of hibernation. So uh, that's not easy on a cold-blooded animal. So they, they uh, usually shed shortly after that. But uh, this, this dull characteristic is also uh, due to those keels, which break up the uh, reflection of sunlight on the scales. Uh, so uh, the other way you can tell Water snake versus fox snake is habitat. Water snakes, gonna be by water. Fox snakes tend to hang out on woodland edges. They, um, uh, fox snakes lay eggs. Uh, water snakes don't, water snakes have uh, live birth. Um, but fox snakes need to have a suitable substrate for laying their eggs, which is often found in uh, down in, um, highly decomposed logs. Uh, they also will sometimes lay their eggs in landscaping mulch. But um, they tend to not, they need water to drink, but they don't tend to hang out uh, near bodies of water. Uh, whereas water snakes, um, they need to dry out, but they also, uh, most of their food uh, comes from the water. Water snakes, um, they specialize in eating uh, frogs and fish and tadpoles and those kinds of things. So they're not, usually going to travel too far from water. Um, fox snakes, 
they specialize in rodents, uh, which usually aren't near water. So uh, habitat too will help you uh, make your decision of what sort of snake you're looking at. Now, um, last week, uh, Kay, I, I think it was you uh, that was talking about, someone had visited, um, and now I know uh, several of you have visited the sunflower mazes, which are uh, really cool things and they're kind of all the rage this year. You noticed that the sunflowers were all facing east. And I think we've all heard that a sunflower will move and follow, kind of track the sun. Well, I did a little bit more digging on this. And I learned, well, first of all, here's the, the word of the week is heliotropism. And it means um, that how a plant will uh, behave or grow in response to sunlight. So um, the question before was, why were all the sunflowers facing east, even though it was afternoon, it was lunchtime, one o'clock, something like that? Well, the answer I learned was that um, sunflowers only track and follow the sun uh, when they're still growing. Once they've um, hit their, their maturity, uh, their mature size, they stay facing east. Um, so they, they, they want to maximize their exposure to the sun as they're growing, but once they're, they're fully developed, they stay permanently facing east. And um, botanists aren't exactly sure of why this happens, but the theory is that by facing east, they're going to warm up sooner. They're going to catch those first rays of the rising sun. That face of that flower is going to warm up sooner, and that's going to be uh, more attractive to um, pollinators. So uh, having, having a, a stationary blossom, uh, once the plant hits maturity, is going to benefit in the long run by drawing more pollinators to it and scattering uh, the pollen around uh, to other sunflowers that are near. I thought that was kind of a, a, um, a cool answer and, and um, kind of adds to our learning and, and some of the uh, you know, theories that we were kicking around before. This, um, this is uh, what the scientists had to say about it. So um, heliotropism and facing east, uh, that happens when, uh, when the sunflowers are fully mature. Um, now, this was something uh, I, I just threw in kind of last minute. I saw this moth the other day, and I thought, I wonder if anybody else is seeing these. Uh, this was at Hickory Knolls. Uh, this is the sweep uh, of our door on the north side of the building. I was so thankful that I was on the outside of the building going in, because if I was on the inside going out, I don't know that this little moth would have survived. Um, I'll give you a sense here of the size. Here's uh, my two and five eighths inch long lip balm, uh, and I, I moved the, the moth out of the way. <laughs> this was just such a neat looking creature. And, and looking at the shape of it, this um, uh, kind of uh, triangular shape um, with the scalloped edges on the wings, this just screams sphinx moth. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different types of sphinx moths in this area, and most of them will have a variation on this triangular shape. Um, the, you know, the, the hornworms that you get on your tomatoes, we have to, tomato hornworms and we have tobacco hornworms in our area. Um, the tobacco hornworms are actually the more common ones that we have, uh, but they also feed on tomato plants. But they... Uh, the, the, the large caterpillars with the little um, spike coming off the, the back end, uh, that is another way to uh, identify the, the larva of a sphinx moth, uh, the, the sphingidae or the, the, the sphinx moth family. They all have that characteristic in their caterpillars. So I knew this was a sphinx moth, but I wasn't really sure what it was. So I went to good old bug guide. And I pulled up um, uh, the Sphingidae, which is the Sphinx moth family. And Bug Guy does this cool thing where they post uh, recent photos of what they've received uh, 
in these different classifications. And, and you'll notice um, there, it's a really nice way to, to get more familiar with taxonomy, the way um, they have these different classifications. And you can click up and down on the scale. You can be less specific or more specific, depending on how certain you are of what you found. Um, you can even start, if you go to the Bug Guide homepage, uh, this image is there, and you can just start with a general outline of what you found. Yeah, I think it's a butterfly, or uh, I think it's a moth. I don't think it's a bug at all. I think it's a millipede of some sort. So you can you can click on these different shapes, and and you can start you know fairly high up in the taxonomy, and then drill your way down. Well, anyway, Bug Guide will post images of uh, what they've what people have been sending in recently, and I looked and I thought I think this is it right here. So I didn't have to spend a lot of time uh, browsing. This is a neat feature. Uh, and again, this is bugguide.net. Um, and you can, you can browse through these different taxonomic groups to see if you can figure out what you found. But I clicked on this image, and I found out that that little moth stuck on the door at Hickory Knolls was a Virginia creeper sphinx. It makes so much sense. Because what do we have covering a lot of our uh, trees just outside of the nature center? It's Virginia creeper, that five-leafed uh, vine and that's so very common in our woodlands. And uh, lo and behold, there's a caterpillar, a uh, sphinx uh, caterpillar that specializes in feeding on Virginia creeper. Uh, and it produces this cool little moth. So, if you happen to have a lot of Virginia creeper by your house, keep your eyes open. You might be um, uh, visited by uh, the Raps and Myron. Um, I love this, this, uh, this species name. It means um, something graceful or charming. And this moth really was. It was small. It was you know, less than two inches, but it was just a gorgeous. It really it made my day. So um, along the sphinx moth lines, I get this email yesterday, and uh, the, the subject line was, what is this? And it had four question marks. And I always love, it seems like the more exclamation marks or question marks you see, the more exciting the idea is going to be. So um, this person um, has written me before, R. Shaw writes, uh, when I first saw this in my plant, I thought I had some kind of reptile. Then I saw the wings. I had watered the plant and it crawled out, fluttered in, in its wings to dry, I guess, and then it flew off. It was about three inches long. I'm 85 and I can't remember ever seeing anything like this. I hope you can help. Thanks for your time. Well, here's what our Shaw sent. This is the still image. And again, we can see that triangular shape to the body. Um, but much different markings. And at three inches, it was definitely larger than uh, the uh, uh, Virginia creeper sphinx that I'd found. But again, we, we kind of see we're into a season now. The sphinx moths were in August. That's kind of sphinx moth time of year. Um, so this one um, is uh, a sphinx moth that uh, kind of in fact, the, the Chicago Tribune wrote about them a few years ago because they were just everywhere. Um, they seem to um, kind of have boom and bust uh, seasons, and I don't know if we're heading into a boom season for a white line. Uh, so I'm going to give it away. This is a white line sphinx moth. Um, this is the video that um, uh, our Shaw sent uh, of the bird uh, kind of probably shaking off, or the moth shaking off the, uh, the water from when the, the plant uh, got its dousing. But um, you can see the, the white lines that give the moth its name. But you can also kind of see its underwings. I'm going to play this again. Its underwings have a kind of a pinkish tone to them. And they will hover. They're one of the, they, they will um, fly at night. But they will also sometimes fly during the day, and they're a lot of times sighted feeding uh, off of the nectar on uh, hosta plants, on those, uh, uh, the big flowers that hostas put out, and people will mistake them for hummingbirds. 
but uh, that, that pinkish note on the wings and then uh, these prominent white stripes identify this as a sphinx moth. Well, Arsha you know, mentioned in um, his or her email that they thought it was some sort of a reptile coming up out of the potted plant. And that got me to thinking, um, we're going to talk next week a little bit more about weird lizards you can find in this area. But this got me to thinking about this particular phenomenon. Now this is a lizard that was brought to us uh, at Hickory Nose. This goes back a few years. But um, this is a brown anole. Uh, this is uh, actually in Florida. These things are everywhere. They're kind of uh, a little bit of a problem. They are displacing the native green anole down there. Um, and they were brought, uh, I don't know if they were brought over as pets. Uh, they're from Cuban, uh, Cuba and the, the islands off of Florida. They are not native to Florida. But uh, brown anoles are just, uh, so many things are taking over parts of, of Florida. Um, and the female brown anole uh, will lay eggs. They're, I don't know, about the size of a tic tac or so. But she doesn't create a nest and she doesn't make a, you know, lay a whole lot of eggs in one spot. She kind of uh, spreads them around. It's actually a, a great way to ensure the survival of at least some of her offspring because that whole putting all your eggs in one basket is not always such a good thing. So she, instead of putting all of her eggs in one nest, she will distribute. She'll put one over here and then she'll scurry you know, several yards away, um, deposit another egg, and then she'll go another direction and she'll deposit another one. Well, one of the places that uh, is actually quite suitable for egg deposition in Florida, a type of place um, that's preferred by these lizards is uh, outdoor nurseries. And uh, because of the uh, tropical climates in Florida, they, uh, there's companies that grow a lot of plants, palm trees and such that are then shipped to uh, big box stores like Home Depot, like Lowe's. Uh, and oftentimes those pots will have uh, brown anole eggs in the soil. And people, just as Arsha watered the plant and a moth came out, people will water their new tropical plant that they thought was going to be the centerpiece of their, their deck or their porch or their uh, bay window, and a lizard will pop out. Not making this up, this happens. I, 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 we've had uh, two lizards brought to us over the last 10 years, and I've had phone calls from probably a half dozen other people that have had it happen. Um, there was a, a woman that lived over by Lincoln School who said uh, that, that she was feeding this tiny little lizard that she'd found on her, uh, on her porch. And I asked if she had bought uh, tropical plants and she hadn't, but she looked across to her, her next door neighbor and she's like, oh my gosh, my neighbor did. So um, they've been in Batavia, they've been in Geneva, they've been in St. Charles. You can actually, um, I talked to a, a worker at the Home Depot in Geneva and I, I, I think they thought I was, I, I was actually, you know, looking for lizards in the, the plant section. And the little man there said, oh yeah, you know, we see them from time to time. They're really fast though. I can never catch them. Uh, but they're, uh, when they emerge from the soil, they are, I don't know, probably two inches long or so, they're quite small. Um, but I always say, you know, if you uh, happen to see one, uh, try and catch it, try to make it into a pet. It, it will not survive in this climate, but like I said, in, in uh, Florida, they become quite a problem. There's, there's no uh, you know, regulation, nothing to prevent you from uh, keeping a little brown anole as a pet. So, you know, if you're into unusual sources for new pets, uh, try buying a tropical plant at Home Depot and, and see what might come up out of the soil as an extra bonus. Um, so yeah, next week we're gonna revisit lizards in a whole other light. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I just had one other thing here. This was a video, this was from uh, Saturday night, which we'll call Night of the Cicadas. Uh-oh, didn't play. Um, let me see if I can get this to go. 
end of that season now. And I'm going to stop it right here. Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, let me try it one more time. All right, we're going to play. And I'm going to hit pause. No. All right, I guess I can't hit pause. <laughs> I'm just going to have to let it play. Uh, but as it walks, this is a cicada that's emerged from the soil. It's heading for a tree. Look at those front legs. Now, this is an adaptation that the immature cicada has because it digs, it spends its life, uh, that immature part of its life cycle, underneath the ground, digging towards tree root. Um, and it needs to have those greatly enlarged front legs. Now, when it emerges uh, from the soil, it doesn't need those enlarged front legs anymore because it's not going to do any more digging. It's going to be clinging, maybe doing a little bit of flying, although they're not strong flyers. Uh, but they, they need, uh, I'll do it one more time, they need those enlarged uh, and digging uh, front legs to be able to get down to the tree roots and then more important, to get up out of the soil and head for a tree where they'll shed this skin one last time. Uh, oh, there we can pause it. It's a little bit blurry, but um, be on the lookout. If, if This is a great time of night to head out for a walk and look on the sidewalk. Now, they might not be on the sidewalk. I mean, they're, they're coming up out of soil, but a lot of times they have to cross over from uh, where the, uh, they've been feeding underneath uh, the ground on a tree root, and there's a obstruction like a trail or a pathway or a sidewalk before they can uh, get to a tree. They need to get onto a vertical surface so they can uh, pop that shell open and let their wings come out and expand. And uh, sidewalks, uh, driveways, those are great places to look because they're really easy to spot, easy to see the cicadas at this time of the year. Uh, so, so that's what's happening. Um, uh, currently, I'm gonna. I know when I walk home tonight, that's what I'm gonna be looking for. Um, I give you a little teaser for uh, next week's um, Good Natured Hour. We're gonna focus on. Um, it's. I'll be honest. It's it's my totem. It's my spirit bird. It's the cedar waxwing. Uh, that's what this coming week's column is all about. Um, I framed it in the uh, light of a bird with a hidden talent because of what I saw um, when I was watching them feed at Leroy Oaks the other day. Um, but we're, we're going to cover that. We're going to go back and talk a little bit more about um, wasps and bees because I've got some really cool footage that I uh, took at a, a class we had on Saturday on uh, native bees and wasps. I just haven't had time to digest all the footage. Uh, video footage that we took that day. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to uh, go on a lizard hunt in Geneva that I think you'll find quite interesting. So with that, um, I'm going to stop the screen share and we'll open it up here and we'll see, does anybody have any questions or comments um, about things you've uh, seen or heard or read about or anything like that? Not tonight. Oh, what? We've got one in the chat. Um, no? Well, um, I do appreciate your patience. Uh, again, we had some, some upgrades here, and it, it seemed to make my uh, uh, PowerPoint not want to talk, uh, you know, display properly. So I really appreciate your patience at the beginning of tonight's program. Um, getting close to bedtime so uh say thanks for uh hanging with us tonight hey kelly and greg um and i hope we see you all next week thanks great. pam thank you great to see y'all thank you. you too good night good night pam hey folks come on up Okay. Bye. Hi, 
go. There you go. Hi, Boker. No help at all when your computer's not working. I know this for sure now. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone.